Hi, Mike Rogers for the Mike Rogers Show. Today we've got Stephen David Brooks, famous Hollywood director, part three. And today's talk is really interesting for all of you Hollywood cinema lovers. Uh, if you missed part two or part one, the links are down here. So here we go. Interview with Stephen David Brooks. Hey, once again, for the third time, we have Mr. Stephen David Brooks, famous Hollywood guy. And Stephen is one of my best friends, which I don't have very many friends. So Stephen, well, I'm how are honored you today. <laughs> I'm just fine. And wait, so I just mentioned like, I don't have very many friends, and I don't even remember how you and I met. How did we meet? I remember my uh, former manager. I say former because he passed away actually three years ago yesterday or a couple really? of days ago. Mm. Passed away suddenly. Yeah. John Ferreter, um, former William Morris agent, former board member, partner William Morris, was in a band. Mm -hmm. um, and he was trying to get you to play some of those, the songs from the Tearaways, his band on your radio show. Actually, and, and then I found out much later, actually, that you he interviewed you when you were in the Rodders for UCSB Radio. Yeah, that had to be 1977 or 78. Yeah, yeah, so you've known him a long time. So he, at some point, you guys were talking music, and you said to him, I just made this movie called Ghost Roads. I don't know what to do with it, or I want to enter it to festivals or something like that. And yeah. John goes, talk to Brooks. So he connected us because of Ghost Roads. That's that's actually now that you mention it, that's that's right. And John told me that no, Stephen Stephen David Brooks is the guy that you want to talk to. He's got he's won so many awards. So I contacted you, and I'd already entered a bunch of crummy film festivals, but you told me to enter Rain Dance, and I did. And I was working at a TV station here in Japan. It was a Friday night. It was like 12.05 at night. And I get on the train. I look at my smartphone and I see I got an email from Raindance. And I'm reading it and it says, you know, we have it. Accept, congratulations, we've accepted your film. And I kept looking for the word, but. And I, I read it over like five times, but there was no but in there and I was so happy and then I think I called you the next morning the first person I called and told you thanks so much and yeah Stephen David Brooks is responsible for Ghost Roads being screened at Rain Dance. thank well, you very much I just I just suggested the festival I didn't get you in I didn't bribe anybody I didn't call anybody <laughs> yeah but I didn't even you know I hate to say it no I better not say it no I'll say it I never even heard of it. Oh. You know what I'm saying? You know. Well, like I said, with you know, heads and tails, when I got lucky, and then flat trap, when I got a lot of rejections. Between those two movies, I did a lot of research on film festivals, mm -hmm. and of which there are thousands and thousands and thousands now, and yeah. most of them are just not worth entering. Yeah, well, screen screening there doesn't mean anything. But Rain Dance is a well-established festival uh in london and screening there definitely does mean something so what is the difference between a film festival that you enter a film festival and this it doesn't mean anything or a film festival that means something what what is the difference Just, it has it, it has to do with the hype that's created you know if someone wins you know one of the the really big festivals can berlin sundance toronto um telluride there's there's industry the industry the film industry pays attention to those festivals mm -hmm. so you'll get noticed may not mean you're going to get a big agent may not mean you'll ever get another movie made but you'll at least get noticed by the decision makers in the industry mm -hmm. and rain dance is one of those festivals a lot of these really small festivals industry doesn't pay any attention to so that's the main difference so how so a small festival how does a small festival get to become a big festival what is what do they have to do Oof, they have to get lucky <laughs> <laughs> you know they have to be yeah. around around a while mm -hmm. um 
Uh, generally, it also helps for a film to screen there that then later goes on and does big things like Slam Dance, which was opened by a bunch of guys, Dan Mervish and a bunch of other guys who couldn't get into Sundance. So mm -hmm. they started this small festival called Slam Dance that happened at the same time as Sundance. And they ended up popping up on the industry radar because they screened Christopher Nolan's first movie. Oh. And then he went on to direct um, Memento mm -hmm. and then a lot of other movies. So because it was Christopher Nolan's first movie, that became their, then they became the guys who discovered Christopher Nolan. So that put Slam Dance on the map. Oh, really? Yeah. I, I didn't even know that. Yeah. But Dan Mervish and somebody else from the, them won a movie, uh, won an award at a movie festival I was running in Japan a couple of years ago. So, oh, that that's amazing. So now I've, I've lost my train of thought because I, I got off on Dan Mervish. But um, <laughs> what, are, what um, so let's go back to how we met. So we, we met with John, John Farreter, and then you told me all this advice. And then from this, you and I have started working on some movie scripts. And a couple of them we can't mention. But uh, the Rosie one we can mention. So um, basically, Rosie, you wrote at least 95% of the script, I figure. All right. So remember remember our discussion of screen credits? <laughs> oh, wait a minute. I can't hear what you're saying. I, 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 what, what'd you say? What'd you say? I don't Yeah, I don't remember it that way. I, I remember it as, as we just kept going back and forth, sending the final draft back and forth. I don't think there's any way to determine who wrote how much. Actually, and we've rewritten that script so many times. Yeah. Yes. Well, that's always the case, right? Yeah. So, okay. So, Stephen, um, we're going to have to wrap up here soon. But how about your dreams and your visions? Any advice you have for filmmakers? Um, what to do? Or even, um, well, maybe we should talk about rain dance and what your advice was about getting butts in the seats. Can you? Oh, yeah. yeah, that was, I mean, the main thing no one will tell you about film festivals. Most people think they get into the film festival, mm -hmm. they're accepted, they can just show up and they're going to have a full screening. It is not the responsibility of the festival to sell tickets to your movie. They mm -hmm. try. They try, they sell passes, they make tickets available. But if they have 100, 150, 250 movies, they're not going to put up 250 posters around London, let's say, if it's Rain Dance, advertising your movie. That's a good um, point. They can't. Yeah. So it's up to the filmmakers to sell tickets. It's up to the filmmakers to promote the screening. Social media, um, the old days, you would print a poster and put it in the lobby. No one does that anymore. No one because they have electronic posters. Um, yeah. And so I, I said to you, now that you're in rain dance, it's your, you need to go and you are responsible for selling tickets to your screening. And if I'm not mistaken, you sold out two screenings and they gave you a third, which yeah. was unheard of. Yeah. But that's, you, you took the advice and you ran with it. And that's why you had, you know, it, a perfect example of, how you sell tickets is you and if you sell a lot of tickets you increase your chance of winning an audience award because you have a bigger audience yeah thank you steven thank you so much <laughs> <laughs> so okay uh, before we go you got to tell us about this betty, betty davis photo yes so, it, it, you bought this at a place uh one of these uh, yeah ebay ebay <laughs> luckily from a guy named steve so it's signed to me uh no when i was still in film school at UCLA and for like a year after I worked part-time then full-time for this old-time agent named Robbie Lance um, and he, he at the time he represented Betty Davis, Elizabeth Taylor, wow, Helen Mirren, Teresa wow. Russell, Peter Schaffer, Milos Forman, Jeremy Irons, Deborah Carr, Sam Neill, Rutger Hauer, Paul Verhoeven, 
And I met all these, I met all of them except Deborah Carr and Elizabeth Taylor. Wow. Um, uh, met Helen Mirren, met, uh, drove Sam Neill around in my car, drove Rutger Hauer around in my car, Jeremy Irons, all these people. So with Betty Davis, she was in her 80s, but she was still getting offers. Mm -hmm. um, and when she was in town, I would, I was the, I was the errand boy. I was the PA in the office. That's all I mm -hmm. did. And I would deliver scripts to her townhouse in West Hollywood. And her yeah. assistant, her assistant Catherine, would always come to the door, take the script, and that was it. And one day I got there like three minutes after five, mm -hmm. and the door opened, and it was Betty Davis. Wow. And she, and she was wearing an L.A. Dodgers jersey. I remember this distinctly. An L.A. Dodgers cap kind of <laughs> angled to one side, and she had a cigarette and a drink. And wow. She was, she was like five feet. Sounds tall. like a movie tiny. scene. I know. I know. She was like, she was like five feet tall, tiny, bright blue eyes. Mm. Which most people don't realize because she did so many black and white movies. And she just looked at me and goes, well, and I just said, I was stunned. Right. <laughs> and I go, oh, Miss Davis, I, I have a script for you from Mr. Lance. And she looked at the label and goes, takes it, goes just a moment. And she goes inside. She comes back. And hand, with a handful of change to tip me. Mm -hmm. I said, no, Miss Davis, you don't have to tip me. I work for Mr. Lance. She goes, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to insult you. I said, you didn't insult me, but you don't have to tip me. She goes, do you want to come in for a drink? I said, I'm still working. I work until seven. She goes, leave that to me. And she walked inside. <laughs> and, and trust me, I've never met a more powerful. I've met a lot of very famous people. And I've never met a more powerful person than Betty Davis. She had this aura about her that was really remarkable. Um, so anyway, there's no way I could say no. So I went in, had a drink. I was underage, but it didn't matter. And we drank <laughs> and, and, and she talked. And I heard her pick up the phone and call the office. And all I heard was, hello, it's me. Steven will not be coming to, back to the office today. He's having a drink with me. Thank you. And she hung up. <laughs> That's so funny. And then from then on, the orders were if I was to make a delivery to her, it'd be after five so I could stay for drinks. And we started doing that. And we just talked and she told me stories about she used to terrorize the, the Warner Brothers and all this kind of stuff. And eventually she asked me, she said, so you want to be a, an agent? I said, no, I want to be a director. I said, I'm already a writer. I haven't sold anything yet, but I've been writing. And she goes, then why are you working for an agency? You have to quit and go be a director. And I thought, yeah, why didn't I think of that? Yeah. So, so the next day I went in and gave my two weeks notice. And like an hour later, I hear the assistant, hear the phone ring and the assistant says, Miss Davis on line two, she called, talked to the agent, knowing that I had quit. Uh -huh. I didn't tell her that I was gonna definitely quit, mm -hmm. but she knew that she suggested it to me and no one could dare say no to her, right? Oh, <laughs> she knew, right? She also knew she was right. She was right, I should quit. So she she said, on Stephen's last day, he must come say goodbye to me mm -hmm. at the end of the day. So I show up that Friday after work, she dressed up. I still remember this sort of green taffeta dress, earrings, makeup, and she, you know, we drank and of course she smoked. Uh, she drank a lot more than I did. And she gave me that photo, autograph photo. And then she also gave me this ashtray. She wow. said, but you don't smoke. I don't. OK, this was, this was her ashtray. And she goes, Fellini gave this to me in Cannes in 56. And I want you to have it wait, what? from one director to another. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Stephen. Look at the bottom of that ashtray. Does it say made in China? No, Luxembourg. Wow. That's so cool. Yeah. So that was, and then I said, uh, you know, before I go, do you have any advice for someone just starting out in the movie business? And she said, she thought about it and she goes, it's okay to be difficult. And she rolled her eyes and goes, well, you don't have to be as difficult as I was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then she said, don't let them underpay you. If they pay you a lot of money, they'll think you're worth it. Which I thought was genius. And to this day, I don't remember the third thing. Mm -hmm. I have a feeling I'll remember it when I need to remember it. Well, so that gives us a great lead in for part series two of the Stephen David Brooks interviews. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> so, Stephen, thanks for being on the show. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. This has been very interesting, very fast paced talk and stuff like that. So, you, yeah, you're a great talker. And let's do this again and like okay. soon. Okay. And we pick up with uh, Betty Davis uh, when you part, whatever, her, at third advice. Well, I don't know what it is. If I remember it, I'll what? let you know. Yeah. So, uh, you know, r- rattle around those rocks in the head and make sure you <laughs> <laughs> you recall it. But thanks yeah. so much for being on the show. Thank you. Thank you, I ladies and it. gentlemen. Thank you to Stephen David Brooks. Hey, did I tell you that talk with Stephen David Brooks and about Betty Davis? That's so funny and so interesting. And um, if you want to be interviewed on this show, contact me at Manihongo Demo Daijobadesyo. And we can do it in Japanese and we can do it in English. And we'll see you back here next time. Don't forget to check out the Mike Rogers Show and the links to uh, part one and part two of the Stephen David Brooks interview is down here. So check it out.